chapter 1, verses 34 through 38. And while you're turning there, I'll go through a few prayer requests. Then after we read, we'll go right into prayer. Um, If you want to remember Carolyn Dodge, she's been in and out of the hospital. Um, Please continue to pray for complete healing in her body. Um, We also uplift our pastoral search. Keep um, praying for that, praying for wisdom for our leaders and for those um, on the search committee. And then also pray for our country um, uh, our, as we move forward there. We ask that you would just keep our country in prayer as well. All right, Luke chapter 1, verses 34 through 38. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be here. Um, We're thankful to have the opportunity to worship you. Um, We pray that you would bless our time together as a congregation. Um, Bless the sermon this morning. We pray that you anoint the lips of pastor. Um, We pray that the Holy Spirit would move and that uh, you would be glorified through it all. We pray that our worship will be honoring in your sight. Um, We do want to uplift Carolyn Dodge and continued healing in her body. We pray that you'll give the doctors wisdom there that they would be able to get to the root cause and be able to find a a sure treatment that would bring uh, comfort to her and healing in her body, Lord. 
Um, we thank you for the free country you've given to us, Lord, as we see um, things rapidly changing. Lord, we do pray that you would really give us as believers a courage to stand for you and stand for truth, that we might live for you in these days, that we might um, turn back to you as a country. Lord, work in the hearts and lives. We see you working in our community. Lord, um, we just pray for mercy. And Lord, we do want to uplift the pastoral search, and we ask, Lord, that you would really just give wisdom where it is needed. We pray that you prepare the right person for that position, that you would point us in that direction. Pray for the search committee as they get feelers out. We ask that you would really just work in a special way there, give them wisdom as well. Um, we do thank you for the blessing of family. And this day we think of specifically of the mothers and we're so thankful for each one. Thankful that you have created that institution of uh, marriage and the institution of the family. Lord, we just ask that you would bless each mother here today. That you give your hand of mercy and grace upon their lives. Again, bless this service today that it bring honor to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. A few of the elementary students, along with some piano kids, have prepared a special Mother's Day treat that we hope you will enjoy. Happy Mother's Day.
Good news, I'm not singing. <laughs> it's fair. <laughs> when Pastor Jerry called me this week and asked me to speak briefly about what my mother has taught me or what she means to me, I thought, this is an easy assignment. But I found out that the command of briefly made this a little bit more difficult. When sitting down to gather my thoughts, I tried to condense her lessons to me in three categories. Much like you sitting in the congregation, the lessons your mothers have taught you would be tough to encapsulate in three categories as well. But after sitting in women's uh, Sunday school today, I'm going to echo much of what was said already to the women in the church. Here we go. My mother taught me the importance of God. It was common practice to wake up while growing up and walk out into the kitchen or living room and see my mom reading her Bible each and every day in the quietness of a household that had yet to start the day. While growing up, there was not a church in ch or there was not a choice in church attendance. You just didn't decide that morning because the decision had already been made. I kid you not. We literally went to church one Sunday by snowmobiles. <laughs> I learned from my mom, you are to use your talents to serve in the church, and I have ample lessons to learn from her as she was Sunday school teacher, youth leader, nursery worker, kitchen help, mission trip leader, nursing home ministries, and that didn't stop at the church walls. It always extended to whomever and whenever. My mom taught me, you give to God and to those he loves. Remember, for God so loved the world, the need never stops. It includes a lot of people. Generosity is a mainstay in my mother's life. My mom taught me you pray for and you build up others for the glory of God. When my mom says she's praying for you, you can take it to the bank. She sends scripture verses through texts to all of her grandchildren and children daily. My mother taught me the importance of family. By the time my mom was 26, she had lost two brothers and her father, leaving only her mother and her in her immediate family. She knows how to cherish the family you have left in your life on earth. And that family is not only made up of those you share marriage or DNA with. She taught me that family works together. She has farmed with my dad since the year I was born, and this woman at close to 73 can still work circles around me. The phrase, I'm bored, excuse me, was rarely uttered in our house growing up because a list of new, fun, and exciting chores could be manufactured in a nanosecond by that woman. <laughs> a family shares together. You share meals, stories, fun, and wisdom and advice such as, World peace doesn't hinge on this. My mother taught me time with family is important, no matter the amount of time you have. I've lived apart from my mom now for decades, now in different states, and the reality is I maybe get to see my mom physically three or four times a year. I'm certainly thankful for technology that allows me even more access, but I'm more thankful that one day I will spend eternity with her, and any time we lost together on earth will more than be made up for by our gracious God. This example is what allows me the grace, hopefully, to let my kids find their way in life, even if it is separated by miles from me. Finally, my mother taught me the importance of leaving a legacy, even though she probably wouldn't put it in those words. I've been blessed with a woman who put God first, family second, and herself a very distant third. I reap the rewards of a godly woman who generations before her also had godly mothers that passed their love of God onto their children. Long after my mother is gone from this world, the, exa <coughs> excuse me, the example she set of how to love, how to laugh, how to share, and how to live will continue because her work for the Lord won't end when she dies. It will live on in me, my children, and God willing generations beyond. I love you, Lord. I love you, Mom.
Happy Mother's Day. Thank you, Stacy. That was both eloquent and brief. I thank you so much. And if you haven't uh, noticed by now, we do value our mothers around here and want you to know uh, we wish you a very happy Mother's Day. There are a lot of things going on, so my recommendation is that you pick up a bulletin if you don't have one already. But gentlemen, if you serve on the pulpit committee, this is not in the bulletin. We'd like to meet at 7 o'clock on Monday evening. The full board will be meeting then at 7.30. Uh, this is the last week for KYB, and I just want to personally say thank you to all the, the army of volunteers that have helped once again this year to make that a wonderful outreach in our community. Uh, next Sunday, Jim and Carol Kanakel will be with us since on Sunday evening at 6 o'clock. Jim and Carol have left their home in Michigan, have gone over to Germany and served the Lord in a camping ministry, and they're going to be here to share uh, their ministry with us and what their plans are to go from here next Sunday night at 6 uh, six six o'clock. May the 15th is a uh, bridal shower for Courtney Fox and that information is in the bulletin and then Wednesday the 18th and the 25th we're setting aside two special Wednesday evenings so that we can seek God by means of prayer and so that'll be in this auditorium at uh, 6 30. And then uh, Thursday May 19th there's a baby shower, a shower honoring Brittany Mills and again that information is in the bulletin. And in the insert in the bulletin is uh, a list of several high school graduates. And this coming Saturday, I believe it's 4 to 6 o'clock, is Matthew Horton's. And so that's going to get things rolling. But there are plenty of others. And all that, again, is listed for you in the bulletin. I want to say publicly a very special thank you to Brad for filling in for me last Sunday morning. I understand he did an outstanding job. Is that correct? So we praise the Lord for that. And uh, let's see, Shirley Dodge is with us this morning, and Shirley, we love you, and we're so thankful for you. She is over in Ada at a nursing home, but she told me she's going to be with us for Mother's Day, and we're so thankful that she's here. And uh, let's see, I better stop there. There's plenty of people we could recognize, but Pauline, it's your turn. Let's go, team. our turn. How's it? Let's please stand as we sing our worship songs together. Let's sing. <laughs> Oh. 
uh, Luke chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, please. I know it sounds like Christmas, but I'm going somewhere with Mother's Day, so Luke chapter 1, please. Um, we were in Chattanooga for a few days last week. There was a wedding on um, Saturday. Uh, our nephew was married, and uh, so we visited with family, had a great time, and I have one of these new smartphones now that we took an, a whole lot of pictures of family members. And has your smartphone ever done anything like this? It, it sort of goes through and takes a picture here, a picture there, a picture over here, and a picture over here. And it actually compiles it all together in video format. Have, has anyone ever had that experience? That's the first time my phone ever did that. It, it kind of gave it back to me, all these pictures that I guess it thought I would like, and it put it in a 45 minute, a second, 45 second segment with a little background music. And I'm very tempted to put it up here on the overhead, but I thought I resisted that temptation. I want to, this morning, I, I've, I've selected six photographs of the mother of our Lord to hold before you. To show you the complete package of a godly mother. And, of course, when we came back into town, the talk of the town was the storm on Tuesday night. And everybody can tell you where they were when they got the, the warnings, the alerts, and things like that. My wife and I were actually walking toward home, for which I'm thankful. And around uh, in front of Jack and Doe, somewhere in through there, we looked over to the west, and there were very ominous clouds. And I got down to the bridge, down by Dollar General. We're still walking a little quicker and uh, the first alert came on my phone but we picked up the pace even more by the time I got down to my street there were warnings that uh, there could be a possible tornado in our area as I walked down Liberty Street there were people out on their front porch people in the street you know just milling about when these sort of things start happening and then it came across the wire that seek shelter Evidently, there was something that was sighted somewhere. And people just ran inside, I noticed, all of a sudden. I gave my key to my wife, and she went inside. And I stayed out and just looked at that western sky. This is very ominous looking. This doesn't look good. And I stayed out there to the very last second. The wind picked up. The rain started uh, coming, and I rushed inside myself. But I couldn't help but think, as I'm studying the life of Mary, that, you know, if you have eyes to see it, ears to hear it, there is a moral storm that has come over our country in recent days by the radical left. And I'm not uh, discouraged by that. Actually, a lot of times I remind myself that you and I were raised up for this moment as Esther for such a time as this. So Less than 10 years, who would have ever thought people would be going around and removing the old ancient landmarks that Proverbs says repeatedly not to do? Who would have ever guessed that names of schools that have been called uh, George Washington High School or even Abraham Lincoln, those names would have to be replaced? Who would have guessed that parents would have actually literally been arrested for speaking out against critical race theory or you know, this transgender confusion that has just overcome our country in recent days. But personally, I'm not discouraged by that. I think of promises in the Bible like Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 19, where God promised that when the enemy shall, not might, or maybe, it says when the enemy shall come in like a flood, here's the promise, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard and I looked that word standard up in the Hebrew. It's the idea of an exact fit. Some of you studied Esther in recent days. Remember, she was the exact fit for the occasion. And I'm confident in a room like this. God is going through row by row by row by row. And he's raising up young people because of the parentage. The parenting being done from this Bible-believing church to rear another generation that will be an exact fit for the occasion. And I'm excited about that. Who would have thought we would have got to live in these most exciting of all days, just before the return of Jesus Christ? 
And the way God has chosen to do it, this, this wedding ceremony that I attended the other day reminded me of it. That ever before God created government, or the church, or your local school, God first established the home. And Proverbs says repeatedly that the wise woman is the woman who will build her house. But the foolish have a way of tearing it down with their hands. Now, you know, I like to send out these little quips each morning to the church. I actually enjoy doing this. It's become like a hobby. And I came across a couple recently that started me down this path to study the life of Mary for Mother's Day. One of them said, if we don't teach our children who God is, someone else will be glad to come along and teach them everything that he isn't. Another one said, millennials, many millennials resent the local church because their parents were good at church, but they were not good at life. And they struggle balancing the idea that they attended a place that consumed their parents' time, but never transformed their lives. I want to hold up for you this morning six brief pictures, photographs of the godliest mother in all the Bible. The one that was privileged that through her womb would come the very Son of God. And show you as we go from portrait to portrait what a godly mother really looks like. Number one. I found that Mary was guided by sin, uh, sincere or genuine faith. We're in the book of Luke chapter 1, and you might glance at it and notice it's a long, long, long chapter. And I just got to tell you, there's some weird stuff going on in this chapter. You remember how it started? There was Zechariah and Elizabeth, John the Baptist's parents, cousins to Jesus. And, and they were well beyond childbearing years. Remember that? And the angel Gabriel only makes two visits that we're aware of in the New Testament. He's only mentioned twice. And one, he knocked on their front door, so to speak, one day and said, guess what? You're going to have a child. Zechariah didn't believe it, so he was quiet for the next nine months as a sign to prove that angel Gabriel knew what he was talking about. So they were well beyond childbearing years. But think about the next time Gabriel shows up in the same chapter. And every time Gabriel shows up in Scripture, always brings a very special message. This time he went up to Galilee, knocked on the door of a young virgin, and said, guess what? That's <laughs> over in this extreme. You're going to have a child. And Mary did what you would have done, what I would have done, <laughs> said, uh, excuse me, but how is this going to work, seeing I've never known a man? Good question. And Gabriel answered her question. He said, uh, here's the plan. This is how God's going to do it. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. The power of the highest is going to overshadow you. And and that holy thing which is going to be conceived in your womb is going to come from God himself. And just to give proof, because by this time I'm wondering, are you sure about this? The, Gabriel said to her, he said, look, if, if you want proof, you can go down south. That's where your cousin is, down in Judea. And you'll find that she has uh, been pregnant now for the last six months. And by the way, after this conversation, the Bible says she made haste in that direction, knocked on the front door of her cousin Elizabeth when she opened the door. John the Baptist went, woo, leaped in her womb. That's what the Bible says. So she's got the plan. She's got the proof. And just before this verse that I'm about to give you, God revealed the power, how he was going to do it. He simply said, with God, nothing shall be impossible. How would you respond if you're a Virgin Mary? Mary said, behold. That word again, you see it all over the scripture, it means stop. I know you're preoccupied with what we're going to have for lunch and beyond this afternoon, but behold, the handmaid of the Lord. God, if that's what you want in my life, I'm all in. How about that? 
Got anybody here this morning who wants to be guided by genuine faith? If you were to dig, that word handmaid is the Greek word for a female slave or a bond slave. And practically speaking, it literally means to devote yourself to another person to the disregard of your own interest. She had genuine faith. How many of us would respond that way if God knocked on our door and said, look, I'm about to turn your world upside down. And you may have been a resident up here in Nazareth, and things have just been sort of, you know, all lined up like ducks in a row. But from here on out, you're going to be mobile. You're going to go down to Jerusalem and back and forth all over the place. And Mary said, I am all in. Several years ago, I went over to New York City with Jay, helping him and his wife take the teens over there. They did evangelism on the street corners. And I remember one Thursday, we had the privilege of going down to a section in New York City where all the vendors show up. And you know where there's a lot of people buying goods, you'll find that there are people who are peddling fake stuff. And there were, what, Rolex watches for sale. There were Oakley sunglasses. And there were these handbags, Gucci handbags, that you could get, you know, just discount, uh, discounted for price. And I, I looked on the Internet just to, out of curiosity. I want to know what's the difference between a, a fake handbag and the real deal. And I found out that there are four basic things that you look for. Number one, look closely at the stitching to see if the fake is sloppy. Number two, if the bag is genuinely leather, duh, it ought to smell like leather. If the bag is legitimate, the zippers ought to work. They ought to function properly. And here's one, the genuine designer bags have a tag with a specific serial number. And I began to think to myself, you know, there's a book in the Bible called 1 John, and it's given over completely five chapters to let us know whether or not we're genuine, whether we're a genuine child of God or not. And it's very simple. John said what? 1 John 3, 24, if you keep, and that word means to guard my commandment. If you're interested in guarding the commandments of God, keeping them, then you dwell in him. He dwells in you. That's not rocket science. Are you interested in being obedient to the commands of God? I was trying to witness to a man this week. He said he didn't know if he was saved or not. He said he doubted his salvation. And I said, you know what Jesus said genuine Christians look like? They repent of their sin. That's the first commandment he ever gave. And they follow him. I said, do you do that? Have you repented of your sin? Are you following him? The second thing 1 John says is that we'll reject the world's philosophy. And, you know, we're exposed to the world's philosophy. I mean, 180 degrees, 360 degrees. It's all around us. And John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. goes on to say, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. But it goes on to say, the things of this world will pass away, but he that doeth the will of God will abide forever. I want to sign up for that team. Genuine faith in Jesus Christ. Here's another one. Do you have a love for other people? Everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. I got to tell you, when I got born again, saved, I began loving the body of Christ, the church. Before, I didn't want to go to church. But now I can't wait to be with the people of God. Finally, 1 John 3, 9 says we have a way of repenting from our sin. If you're born of God, you don't habitually live in sin because his seed remains in you. And you cannot continually abide in known sin because you're born of God. Mary, when confronted by the angel... Instead of resisting and running and giving all kinds of excuses, she simply said, Lord, I'm all in. Be it unto me according to your word. I'm in. Where do I sign up? It simply said, not my will, but yours be done. Here's a question. 
Do you have the courage this morning? Father's Day, I might say, do you have the guts to follow Jesus Christ? What does Mary look like? Number one, she was guided by genuine faith. Now, if you're still in First Luke chapter 1, turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 42. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 2, verse 42. That's just a page away in my Bible. Luke chapter 2, verse 42. After the birth of Christ, I'm grateful that we have about four or five days in the life of Christ when he was 12 years old. Wouldn't you like to know what Christ was doing when he was 12 years old? And parents, here's a goal for your child once they're born, for them to be doing these three things I'm about to give you by the time your child is 12. But in order to do that, you need to operate from a long-range perspective. Mary and Joseph went from Nazareth down to Jerusalem. This is the context. Every Passover. And folks, that's not down to Dunkirk or even Kenton. That's like almost to the north side of Dayton, Ohio. It's a long ways away. And normally they traveled in caravans. Families would go together from that part of the world. And when they got there one time, they observed Passover. It was a big occasion. They started traveling back home. And when it came time to pitch tents that night, they traveled a day's journey. Think about that. Maybe 10 or 12 hours. They looked around and discovered that somebody's missing in the crowd. And it was Jesus when he was 12 years old. I don't know about you, but this is very instructive to me. Look at verse 42. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. So what do you do when you look around and see your 12-year-old not in the pack? They turned around and they went back to Jerusalem and searched for him. Now, you know, Jesus had other stepbrothers and even stepsisters were told in the Bible that one was called James and one was called uh, Judas, one was called Joseph, and one was called Simon, and he had at least two sisters. So you have all these children who are between the ages of 1 and 11 or 12, and Mary's got her hands full. You know how it goes. I, I was with my children who have children and so I have grandchildren now and it just brought back a flood of memories of what mothers go through when they're with their children these days you know about checking to see if they've got smelly diapers and that sort of thing just brought back a flood of memories of course men know what to do when the baby has a smelly diaper right you say honey uh, work to be done but I mean you got all this going on and they go back to Jerusalem and they search for him and the Bible says it took three days to search for him. And when they finally found him, this is in verse 48. When they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why have you thus dealt with us? Behold, your father and I, we've sought you. This is an interesting word, the word sorrowing. It's used three other times in the New Testament. Twice later in the book of Luke. It's used when the, man, the rich man died and went to hell. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Same word as sorrowing. Son, what have you done? Your father and I have spent the last three days tormented over you. But you know what they had done in those 12 years with Jesus? And I know he's divine, the son of God. I get that. But what a challenge for mothers today to have your son doing this by the time they're 12 years old. She had taught her son to stand alone. I mean, the caravan was going that way. Jesus is 12 years old. And for the Hebrew, at the age of 13, they have a bar mitzvah, a very, a very a special occasion where they celebrate the child now entering into a, the adult life. He's 12 years old. He's in the temple. And the Bible says he's both hearing and he's asking questions with the teachers. How about that? 
that tells me he's also serious minded. I don't know about you, but when I was in school, I didn't want to get close to the teacher. I might have more homework to do, right? But Jesus was among the teachers, hearing and asking questions. Boy, I'd love to hear some of those questions, wouldn't you? But there's one other thing. And Jesus said, down in verse 49, look at it with me. He said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wished you not, or did you not know, that I must be about my father's business? I would hope that by the time my child is 12 years old, going into adulthood, and we've moved that back to 18 and 21, I understand that. But I would hope my child can stand against the pull of the crowd. I would hope my child is serious-minded. And I would hope most of all that my child wants to do what's most important, and that is the will of God for their life. So there's the second photograph. She operated from a long-range perspective. Number three, she developed a a very obedient mindset. Fast forward to John chapter 2. This is the first miracle of Jesus. I see I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit, so buckle your seatbelt, okay? When they were running out of wine during the, uh, the... the marriage of Cana of Galilee, the mother of Jesus looked over at him and said, Jesus, they're having no wine. Just north of where Jesus grew up, there's a little place called Cana of Galilee. Now, I just came from a wedding, so I know how these things sort of go. I mean, it gets kind of awkward because you got one family over here at a table, one family over there at the table, and, you know, maybe the bride and groom, their friends over here and some other friends over there that they work with, and it's sort of awkward Well, the mother of Jesus was sitting there, and it became very, very uncomfortable because it's embarrassing. These things lasted for days, these festive marriage celebrations. So she spoke up, and she said, Jesus, four words, they're running out of wine. And Jesus looked back at her and said, woman, what have I to do with you? Mine hour has not yet come. She goes like, whoa, whatever he says to you. Do it. And Jesus then took it from there. He said, fill up the six water pots. They filled them up to the brim, and he transformed it into wine. But Mary was learning a very basic principle to develop an obedient mindset. Number four, she learned the value of a death of a vision. Now, to develop this very quickly, I need to go back to Luke chapter 2. You might still be in that general area. This is when Simon took Jesus in his arms, eight days old. He was taken up to the temple to be circumcised. And Simon, God told him that he wouldn't die until he saw the Lord's Christ. Well, now he's holding him in his hands. And he looks at Mary, the mother of Jesus, and says, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. Giving her a long-range forecast of what this child would do for the nations of the world. He will leave the splendor of heaven. He will come to the depths of this earth so that he can reach down and take the people who are down in the dumps, down in the depths, and bring them up to God the Father. He's right side up so he can come to lift the brokenhearted and the fallen and take them to where they need to be. He goes on to say in this prophecy... A sword's going to pierce through his own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Chris Cortez, would you do me a favor? Could I use you for an object lesson this morning? Good. You're a senior in high school. Would you come up here for just a moment, please? Chris, I only pick on people I know can take this, okay? So I'm going to pick on you. Would you stand right about here, right in front of me and face the audience? This is my friend, Chris Cortez. He's about to graduate, by the way. But if a spear were to go through Chris and reach my heart, it would be disastrous for both of us. Would you agree? Some of you know families who have gone through tragic, 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 tragic divorce with their loved ones. Say, for instance, if my daughter were to experience a divorce... Don't you think that would affect me also? If we're riding in a car and Chris is driving, he takes the brunt of the crash. It's going to affect me also, right? You can be seated. Simon was telling Mary 
I want you to think long range, Mary. Because this little child that I'm holding in my arms right here, one day, a sword is going to go through him and it's going to pierce your heart also. You keep reading Luke's gospel long enough and you'll see Mary standing at the cross. She probably saw that sword driven up into his side and taken out by sheer hatred. The Roman soldiers. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning who had a dream, a vision. God gave you. And you know it came from God. God, God gave you this thing. And yet, for that thing to be executed, it had to be stomped on and crushed. I, I mean, we could develop stories in the Bible like this. Joseph. Joseph, you're going to be the leader over all Egypt one day. And what happened to him? He was found himself in a pit, found himself in a prison. Thirteen years later, the dream comes or the vision comes to fulfillment. You could go through Moses' life. You can go through the many people that God has greatly used, and you'll discover that they've had to have their vision absolutely demolished. God begins by giving us a birth of a vision and then the death of a vision. And then sometimes there's a double death. They put Jesus in the tomb and then what they do, they roll the stone and they sealed it. He's never coming out of there. And this poor grief-stricken mother, I'm sure all she could remember were those words from Simeon 33 years ago. That the sword's going to go through him and pierce your heart as well. Does anyone know what happened on the third day? There was a glorious fulfillment of that vision. And if it happened to people like Abraham, Moses, Joseph, you name it, it happened to them. I suspect it will happen to every mother in this room. It didn't work out the way you thought it would. But God had his plan behind it all. There is going to be a glorious resurrection. And she saw that resurrection. By the way, one last thing in Mary's life. I look to see what's, where's the last place that Mary is mentioned. It's in Acts chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Just when you thought Jesus couldn't do anything else to blow your mind away, the disciples saw him lift off from the Mount of Olives. And they stood there gazing. Well, of course they were gazing. Not a time to be on your cell phone at that point. But they went back to the upper room. And they stayed there, 120 people. And on the 50th day, called Pentecost, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit fell without measure. There appeared unto them cloven. Don't let the word cloven scare you. It simply literally means to distribute. And the word tongues means various languages. God unloaded on them His Holy Spirit so that they could speak to the then known world right into their very dialect. And they began to take the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, literally to the then known parts of the world. And he's still interested in doing that today. And Mary was a part of that crowd. It was as if these, these men were like gloves on a shelf, just sitting there. And isn't it wonderful when somebody comes and picks up a glove, puts their hand into it. Man, what that glove can do now, right? When the Holy Spirit filled these disciples in the book of Acts, they went out and they turned the world upside down for, for God. In fact, chapter 2, verse 41 says, the same day when Peter preached the sermon on Pentecost, there were about 3,000 souls that were converted. Moms, what a challenge for us this morning. I've just tried to walk you through the life of Mary. What a challenge to ask yourself this morning, am I being guided by genuine faith? I mean, when God knocks on my door, has an assignment for me, is my first response, Lord, here am I. She operated from a long-range perspective. She developed an obedient mindset, learned the value of dying to yourself, and yielded herself to the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads this morning. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I wonder... Do you know for sure that you're saved? That you have genuine faith? Is there a desire deep within you to want to be obedient to the commands of Christ? To want to read His Word? To want to fellowship with His people? To want to become like 
his son, the Lord Jesus. If you've never repented of your sin, that means to turn from them and start following the Savior. Let me encourage you to do that first and foremost. Be a great opportunity right now for you to make that decision. And now for both mothers and fathers and anyone in this room this morning, wouldn't you like to be like the Virgin Mary? To set out to follow Jesus Christ and let him turn your world upside down. There's nothing like it. If there was something more exciting than this, listen, that's where I would be this morning. But there's nothing like following Jesus. Lord, you see our hearts this morning, and I'm thankful that you do. You look beyond all the ties and the suits, all the fancy dresses, and you're looking deep into our hearts just now. And I'm praying that you'd help us to make good decisions during this invitation. If there's someone here who needs to accept Jesus Christ, may this be the moment of their turning to him. All of us, Father, would you help all of us to come to the place where, like Mary, we surrender ourselves to you completely. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing, There is none like you. If God spoken to your heart, why don't you come forward during this invitation? to observe the Lord's table and uh, something the Lord showed me 